please turn your attention to the word provided by Dr. King. Dear God, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you. This is the day you made. We are rejoicing and we are glad in it. In this sermonic moment, we pray for your anointing, your power, your authority, your attention-grabbing power, mm, that we do not leave here the way we came, that there's a message, there's something you want us to do and to change so that we may be all that you have called us to be. God, I thank you. And perhaps there is one who has come who's, who does not know you in the pardon of their sin. They've not repented and asked you to be Lord and Savior that this day they will ask. They will respond to the tug of the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your anointing because it destroys yokes. We do not minister. We do not sing in our own power or strength, but we surrender to you as you are the greatest power and we will never be defeated. So we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, we seal this prayer. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on and just put your hands together again. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to ask that you would turn with me to Psalms 90, verse 12. And it reads as thus, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I want to thank God for this morning. It is also what we are now calling graduation um, Sunday, the fourth Sunday of uh, June, as we acknowledge our graduates. And um, this is also the last Sunday of our stewardship series in which we have been talking about our theme for the year is loving God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And with stewardship, we see it as a way of loving God through our resources, being good stewards of our resources. Amen? Amen. Pastor started out the series with It All Belongs to God, Psalms 24 and 1, and then went into the tithe as, a, as, a, as our stewardship of our finances, our resources, a tithe. Our talents, he did a powerful Bible study on Wednesday also. If you haven't gotten it, go back to our Facebook link or our um, YouTube link because he really is challenging all of us to make sure we're giving of our talents, our skills, abilities, our gifts in service to God. That's how we live out our purpose also. And today I'm going to focus on time. And um, just as a reminder, I want to talk about um, who we are as believers. Everyone in here who's a follower of Christ, who says they've been saved, they re uh, received Jesus as Lord and Savior, um, you're born again, that means God is also calling you to be a steward of the resources God has given you. And a steward, as a follower of Christ, you are called by God to be a steward of all the resources and gifts given to us. A steward is a person who uses, manages, and takes care of their God-given gifts and resources to the glory of God. I'm asking you, if you haven't already done so, pull out your pen and paper or your device because at the end, I'm going to ask you to write something down that is a takeaway from this message. It's more of a teaching today, primarily because I want to speak to all of us, but particularly I want to speak to the graduates. <clears throat> and so on last week in our youth, the net service, they listed talents, for instance, our resources and gifts that we've been given. Um, your skills that you've developed, uh, abilities that you have, um, spiritual gifts and, and natural gifts and your experiences. Those are all talents that you want to take an inventory. And Lord, am I using these to your glory? Am I being a good steward? Or am I squandering them away and not using them, sitting and, and not being active? 
treasure, our money for sure. We're very uh, a church that exists on tithes and offering, but we don't beat you over the head asking for long lines of we have a $100 line or a $200 line. That it's part of our responsibility as stewards to give, to be generous because God has given to us. Amen? But it's also our possessions. It was interesting to hear the teens talk about the things their parents have given them or grandparents or other figures in their life. Their possessions, their Xboxes, right? Uh, Their cell phones, (laughs) their whatever. They're like, oh, okay, those are given to us by our parents, but God uses our parents to give them, right? And then um, relationships. They even began to see that relationships, people they hang with and people we hang with, for those that are professionals in the workplace, we call that our social capital. That the stronger your network and the people that you are in relationship with that are helping you move mutually towards goals of mutuality, that's part of your social network. And our college students are beginning to learn that. We have a series on being ready for career career readiness. And that's one of the things we're teaching you, that um, what you learn in school is important, but also as you develop healthy relationships that can help you towards your goals. Um, They began to realize their bodies, our bodies, are something we've got to be a good steward of. Is what we put in our bodies, our, the, the food, clearly keeping drugs and, and alcohol abuse out of our bodies, but even how we uh, uh, handle our bodies in relationships according to God-given principles, right? And then the environment, the natural environment, we don't often think about, and then for sure today, time. Um, how we use our time. And too often we take time for granted. In our culture, we have the tendency to waste time. That's a phrase we'll hear. you just wasting time, right? Or um, you look up and somebody's been on the internet all day and they look up and say, ooh, I let time get away from me. I'm supposed to be cleaning the house, right? <laughs> or we note how time flies. But to be steward of all that God has given and to live out our lives on purpose, we must be intentional and mindful about the time we've each been given. When we look at today's text, what we recognize is the text, the Psalm, Psalm 90, is attributed to Moses. They call him the man of God. We know Moses and the parting of the Red Sea and the children of Israel in the wilderness. And Moses starts this psalms off with, oh, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Think about it. Moses' experience with God was they led the children of Israel through the wilderness, and for 40 years they had no permanent dwelling. They wandered. Even what we would call a church, and later Jewish culture was synagogue or temple, they had the tabernacle. Every time they moved to another place, they had to uproot their tabernacle and move it also. So it was a temporary dwelling in a sense, right? And so Moses learns through all this that though I've been transient and I've been journeying and it seems like my life is not stable in this earth, God, we know that you've been our dwelling place. You are who we can count on, and that's what I want us to get today is that, number one, God is our dwelling place. And and he goes on then to compare the eternal nature of God to the very temporary, transient nature of humans. He says that God, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He says, uh, any of you remember your math, uh, uh, minus infinity to positive infinity, remember that? They're saying that you are from negative infinity, positive infinity, from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. We can't number you, count you. We can't put you on a scale. We can't put a ruler to try to designate your greatness, your vastness, your identity. But we are finite, he says. As a matter of fact, he says that we've been given 70 years as humans to live. And if by chance, he says, some of us might get 80. And we live in a time in which we know so many who haven't even gotten that. So the irony here is he goes on to say, he transitions this psalm into a prayer. And in essence, Moses says, because of the brevity of life. 
because of the transient nature of our existence on earth, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The goal of numbering our days is that we might be wise stewards, giving you glory, but wise stewards of all that we have been given and all that we are. So what does it mean to number our days? When we think of number or numbering, we might begin to think of counting. Um, that to number our days, we might think is to count our days. Moses in this psalm, again, as I said earlier, said that the life expectancy of people of his time was between 70 and 80. Does anybody know what it is of our day? Well, the life expectancy in the U.S. is 78.8, an average. 73.5 for men, 79.3 for women. And that does not even account for any cultural differences. I didn't look it up by race. And in some segments of our culture and our lives, the life expectancy is even lower because of gun violence and, and uh, health disparities. But yet we look and see how God is good even in this congregation. And we look and we have somebody who celebrated 93 on yesterday. And so, really, the irony is that none of us knows how many days have been allotted to us. Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed to humans once to die, then the judgment. And if that appointment to transition from this life into eternity suggests that if that appointment has been set, then there's a, a specific number of days, plural, that have been allotted to us before that appointment comes. But we don't know what it is, right? There's a specific number of days appointed to us before we transition from this earth realm into the eternal realm. And we don't know what the date and time of that appointment, but we must live each day on purpose according to the values instilled within us by our faith in Christ and the Christian principles left us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the word of God. Can I get an amen? amen. So really, only God can count our days. Only God can count the number of our days we've been given, but what we can do is make our days count. We can make each day matter. We can make each day count to the glory of God, in service to God, and to the people God has assigned us to. Too many of us live out our lives short-sighted, living day by day, pleasing the flesh, making reactionary choices and decisions that have long-term consequences and cause us to live beneath the privileges that God has given us to live this abundant life in Christ. This psalm is often read at home goings and funerals and making acknowledgement of that the person who is lying before us in the casket um, um, may have lived a good life. But the reality is it's for us in the living it's for the graduates today. It's for the parents and grandparents. It's for all of us that this message is we've got to make our days count. I think about today we're going to celebrate an, an eighth grade graduate, a graduate from the eighth grade, all the way up to college and trade school graduates. You've got to make your days count. As you prepare for high school, you've got to make your days count. And they may be in with Children's Church, some of them today. As they prepare for high school, they've got to make each day count. Graduates have to set goals, yes, seek uh, um, to start better careers, but those careers should really be based on hearing and sensing a call of God within to live out your life. And we don't often think of careers and calling as connected, but there's this sense of when you get a feel for what God's purpose is for you, because each of us has a purpose, when we get a feel for God's purpose for us, we start leaning towards things that catch our attention, that excite us, that motivate us. And that's a cue, college students, not just your majors. I pray you chose your majors based on some things that kind of excited you, some things that um, um, you kept feeling inside. 
That is making your days count that you're sensitive to the voice of God saying, this is what I've created you to do. Amen? This is where the path I want you to go. And the earlier we can learn that as young people, the more we can then live out this life of purpose. So, yes, set your goals, graduate, and, 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 and move on, but make your days count. I'm going to give you three ways for you to make our days count, and that's for all of us in here. I want you to write a number down. I want you to remember 168. 168. Write that down. And I want you to start thinking about the long haul, 168. 168, if this was a Bible class, I'd ask you to tell me. So if you are on the chat function on Facebook, go ahead and write it in, or you write it down if you know what 168 stands for. It is the number of hours in a week. Too often we think about 24-7, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. But if you live your life in short increments of day by day, you miss the ability to be a little more strategic and to then be able to plan out across a little more of the long haul. Too many of us are short-sighted. Day by day, the church make an announcement about something coming up next week, and because you're focused on the day, you ignore and, and don't pay attention to what we're saying, right? I know, I'd, ouch, you can go ahead and say ouch, Right? Or something else comes up and you don't have capacity in your schedule because you've not planned out or thought about it in a longer span of time. So yeah, 168 is the number of hours in a week. We all get the same numbers of hours. Now you may not get the same lifespan, but at this moment, unless God calls you home the next second, we all get 168. And the question is, how are you using your 168? To make your days count, you've got to be strategic with your 168. Each week, I start off my week with a to-do list. And my to-do list is for the whole week. It'll say week of whatever the um, first number of the, the, day is, the week is, week of to-dos. And I'll put buckets of activities together. And I'm going to give you some daily things that I put down, but my intention on my list is each day of this week, these are some standards that I've got to do. I'm going to give you those in a moment. But after I do the standard buckets daily, and those are all about my spiritual disciplines and my relationship with God and my physical health, then I'll look at my client, a bucket for client work, bucket for church work, bucket for family work, bucket for personal work, right? And I might not get everything done on a Monday, but if I plan it out right, I have a week to get some things done. And what you'll begin to do when you do that is, first of all, begin to see the themes and patterns in your life that some of us are overcommitting that we have put so much on our plate, we can't get it done in a year, let alone a week. I stepped on some toes again, huh? I see my sister over there laughing. I know, right? You say yes to everything. <laughs> and you begin to see patterns. And because daily we're having these conversations with God, we start listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying, what should be on your plate. And I call this my purpose plate, that at the core is my purpose. And then anything I take on should be aligned with the purpose. Okay. 168. So what I want you to do is then, after remember 168, I want you to develop some daily practices or habits. Remember the to-dos and the goals are longer term, but you've got to develop some daily habits, daily practices that allow you to get through the week. First of all, you, uh, what I do is I start off with prayer and devotions. And let's say you did just 15 minutes a day of prayer and devotion, seven days a week. That's 105 minutes per week or 2.75 hours per week. 2.75 hours a week. Remember, you got 168. 
2.7. I, I saw you, DeMarco. You're like, what? That's only 2.75. <laughs> right. That's like 2% of your week. I hope this message is having you think. And so what if you doubled it to 30 minutes a day, seven days a week? That's 3.5 hours a week. And that's that, I'm sorry, that 3.5 hours is only 2% of your week. Now, I'm going to give you something that I pray startles you into some different action. Can you imagine how strong each of us would be in the Lord if we gave a tithe of our time to the Lord each week? That would be 16.8 hours per week. Round it down, 16 hours a week. You have time for morning worship. You can make sure you prioritize coming to Bible study just one hour a week. Half hour for our prayer calls. You might attend multiple prayer calls. Three hours per week for devotions and prayer. And then that still leaves you a good 10 hours for other spiritual activities that can be talking with colleagues and friends about the Lord, praying with others, resting, spending quiet time. Does that make sense? 16.8 hours a week that can help build you up listening to God and others. Some of the habits that I want you to begin to take on then, spiritual growth habits, daily prayer, daily Bible reading, because these feed and fuel our spirits. Some would say that, you know, we're physical beings, and the reality is, according to the Hebrew scriptures, and it talks about God breathed into humans, and we became a living soul. We are spiritual beings having an earthly experience. You get that? And if we're going to make it in this world, what really is helpful is when we are tuned in to our creator, the heavenly spirit that guides us through the Holy Spirit. So these habits aren't just to-dos I want you to do so you can check them off and keep you busy. I'm not one for busy work. If it doesn't have a purpose, I don't think you should be doing it. Busyness is different than business. And the letters that make the difference is the Y and the I. And when the I has a Y, our busyness moves to business. Does each of us have a why for why we do what we do? So our spiritual growth habits, daily prayer, daily Bible reading, feeding, fueling our spirits. The U version, uh, many of us have the Bible apps, have some wonderful Bible reading plans and devotional plans that may take five minutes, five minutes to read, five minutes to pray. I think there are also some identity habits I want you to put in place. And I do this with the women's ministry about once a year, and it's time to bring these back out. Remind yourself daily of who you are. Why? Because as children of God, as believers in Christ, the enemy wants you to fail, wants to trip you up, trap you up, tell you lies about what you're not, what you don't have, who you're not, right? And when you're not in your word or you haven't reminded yourself of who you are, you'll fall for those lies, You'll go looking for love in all the wrong places. You'll go making choices and decisions based on the enemy tripping you up or your flesh falling for it. Amen? Amen. But because we are in Christ, we've got to affirm daily who we are and confess what the word says about you. And the praise team knows that, yeah, I love that song that y'all sing, that um, uh, there is a law of confession. You must say what God has said. I have lived my life by that for 20 years now. You must say what God has said. When the devil says you're down, you must say that God has said you're the head and not the tail. When, 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 when somebody wants to talk about you're nothing, you can say according to Genesis 1:28, I am created in the image of God. 
See, there's some confessions, and all confession means in the Greek is hum. It comes from the Greek homologia. It means say the same thing. You've got to find in the word what God has said about you and say that. And if you've got to say it every day, there was a season in my life I put a series of confessions together. I said every day, I think for two years. And what that does is begin to program your very spirit and every fiber of your being and your DNA to line up with what God says about you so that when the devil or society or racism or sexism tries to put you down and tell you what you're not, you can say, oh, but I can say what God says. (laughs) Whose report am I going to believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. There's some words that are directly related to us as believers that we've got to know and then there's some that God will take out of scripture and give you a rhema word, revelatory word through the Holy Spirit and now that one's for you too because I'm giving you that promise now. Let me give you some of them. Number one, I am fearfully and wonderfully made according to Psalms 138, 14. Society wants you to think you're not beautiful. You're too big, too small, too short, too tall. You say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I love the Song of Psalms or Song of Songs or Solomon. Um, um, one five says, I am dark and lovely. Or we would put it in today's vernacular, I'm black and beautiful. Y'all didn't know that was in scripture, did you? According to John 3, 16, I am loved by God. According to Matthew 5, 13 through 14, I am the salt of the earth and I am the light of the world. In other words, through Christ, I am an influencer. I penetrate and make a difference on every place I go. And I can change and shift the environment because I am the light of the world. If we walk in his light, then his light permeates us and we make a difference where we are. I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Romans 8, 37. I am a winner. I will not be defeated. Why? Because God is the greatest power. There's four in Ephesians 1, uh, verses 5 through 7. I tell you to go get them. It's I am blessed by God with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm adopted into God's royal family. I am chosen from the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him in love. And I have been accepted in the beloved. I grew up in a small town in which when we first moved to this town, I was bullied. I was rejected by the girls who looked like me. I learned very early on the pain of rejection and bullying. But how many know that when I got born again, it didn't automatically get delivered. But it is when God revealed to me that I was accepted in the beloved. I don't care who rejects me now because I know who I'm accepted by. Glory to God in the highest. And then there are physical habits I want you to get. And, and, and we're different stages of our lives. And I know some of the seniors, there's medications uh, um, that uh, uh, take those medications. I think of my mother. God gave her 91 years. Mom was, she wouldn't mind me saying it if she was still alive at 40. And somewhere in her 40, she was diagnosed with diabetes. She didn't ignore it. She didn't um, play like it didn't happen. Mom became so diligent in following the doctor's orders. She pricked three times a day. She wrote it down meticulously. She had notebooks with her numbers, and she knew what to do when they'd get out of order. So by the time she came to me, I was as religious, and and that's not the right word. Uh, I was as rigid and, and straightforward in doing the same thing. So yeah, there might be some things that crept into your body then, then yes, we know God is ultimately the healer and can heal instantaneously, but God also uses the medical doctors, and you better follow <laughs> those guidelines. And young people, young people, there's some of you, you can avoid some of this if you begin to shift your eating habits and, and lifestyle habits now. Commit to not putting anything in your body that will harm it. Drugs, alcohol abuse, eat healthy. Get plenty of sleep. We, we, we ignore the power of sleep. Groom your body. Keep it clean. Draw boundaries on sexual activity that does not align with the word of God, no matter what the culture says. Well, thank you, Amen Corner. 
And then the last, guard against time wasters. You knew I was going to have to get there, didn't you? So let me, the first big time waster is having a lack of planning and organization. Failing to plan, you're going to plan to fail. Get organized in your life, your closets, your office, your bedrooms. Get organized so you know where things are. You can pick them up. Many of us are stressed because we just live in clutter. And I'm the type that uh, when my office and other places get cluttered, y'all, I can't think. I feel like I'm just discombobulated. I, you just can't imagine the amount of peace I start feeling when I just organize my And I will let things pile up. So I have a tendency that I have to go regularly and just organize. Secondly, you've got to get clear goals and objectives because unclear goals and objectives are going to be a time waster. You're going to just do anything that comes. You have no goals, no objectives, right? Goals and objectives help us prioritize our activities, and they must align with God's purposes for us. So you just can't say yes to everything. Goals and objectives help us determine what our priorities are. Okay, young people, I'm coming down your pew. Oh, wait, time out. This is for the old people, too, because now everybody's social media. Social media can be a time waster. Now, they laugh at us old folks because we're all on Facebook, so the young folks aren't even on Facebook anymore, but they on TikTok. Talk, talk, tick. <laughs> tick, tick, talk. The clock is wasting as you're on TikTok watching vi um, um, videos all day, right? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> I, know, I know, right? <laughs> I got on once. But... Ours, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn even, Instagram. So I'm not, I, I'm, a, I'm an author. I have to be on social media to build um, the readers and connect. So I'm not I'm maligning social media straight out, but I'm saying we've got to be wise in how we use it. Like any other resource, social media can be used, can be used for good or for bad. It can be a valuable use of time or a drastic waste of time. I saw this on, uh, on Instagram the other day. It says, the internet has loads of distraction, education, and opportunity. An easy way to use it is for distraction. Hours watching videos on TikTok or the gram. A smart way to use it is for education and opportunity. There's a lot of good teaching principles out there, motivational quotes, etc. My question for you is what percentage of your 168 are you wasting on distractions on the internet versus what percentage are you using for growth and opportunities? Begin to be intentional about that. And just in case I didn't come down your pew with social media, how about television or streaming shows? I have somebody who's very precious to me. I don't know if she's watching today. And I said, oh, you, you really are a good reader. How many books have you read? She goes, you know what? I used to read, but now Netflix got me. <laughs> they will put those series on and hook you. You'll start with one episode, and next thing you know, you'll spend all day watching five episodes in a row, right? You don't have to raise your hand. Ouch, I know, me too. Mm -hmm. so, so again, what percentage of your 168 are you spending on Netflix? And then the final one is just plain out procrastination. How many of us just will put off until tomorrow what we really should be doing right now? And especially if it's tedious or we perceive it as tedious. So procrastination, that's a time waster. So here's where we are. I want you to just get quiet and still. And to remind you, make your days count. That's the message. And I've given you a lot of good tips on how to make those days count. First and foremost, then, if I could have the ministerial team come forward. The first is an altar call for those who have maybe not made their calling and election sure. I'm going to ask everyone to stand because it makes it easier to come out the aisle. And I'm going to ask that you close your eyes so that this is a private moment for everyone. 
close your eyes, hands bowed, and I want, whether it's young or old, I want you to raise your hand if this day you want to make an assurance of God's grace in your life that perhaps you've been coming to church, but you really have never confessed Jesus and said, Lord, I want you in my life to guide me for the rest of my life. If that is you, I want you just to raise your hand wherever you are, and we're going to pray for you. This is one of those moments that it is a turning point. It's no longer about just showing up, being active, or not even being active, but just showing up. It's about making sure spiritually that core, you can make your days count when you get that purpose in Christ. Raise your hand, if you will, if today is the day that you will pray with me, a prayer of salvation, a prayer that says, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to know where I'm going to spend eternity, and I know if I confess Jesus is Lord. He says that with the mouth, confession is made to salvation, and with the heart, one believeth unto righteousness. That's the word. Is there one? Raise your hand, and a minister will come and pray with you. Is there one? Amen. 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 Then the second thing is, if you know that based on this message of stewardship, that today you want to make a commitment to be a better steward of your time, using some of the principles, practices, and actions that I gave you, something stuck with you, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Every eye closed, every head bowed. God sees your hands. God sees your hands. And I'm going to pray with you. And then I'm going to ask you to sit back down because then I'm going to ask everyone to write one thing down you're going to do differently. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I do bless you and honor you and I thank you for this message and for this word that pricks our hearts and is motivating many of us to change and to become better stewards of our time. Time is a gift in eternity. Etern in eternity, we don't have to worry about time, but in this earth realm, time is a gift and we need to steward it well that we might become all that you've called us to be to live out this life the way you've called us to live it out. So, Father, I pray blessing and healing and wholeness upon everyone that has raised their hands. This is a commitment between them and you. And, God, you see the hands. But more importantly, you already saw the heart. And you knew you were tugging on their heart saying, this is for you. So, God, we thank you. We bless you. We believe you for change and for testimonies that will come forth. We seal this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone to sit down, pull out your device. The um, um, Elders, I'm going to ask elders and evangelists and um, ministers, I'm going to ask you to stay because pastor's going to open the doors of the church just in case. But I want you to write down that one, one change that you're going to make as a result of this message and we're going to ask God to give you that accountability system. But the first step is always write it down. And you're more likely and more prone to follow up on what you write down. Type it in your device. Write it in your journal. Write it on your heart if you don't have anything to write it down. One thing that by the grace of God and starting tomorrow, you carve out a percentage of that 168 to sit with God and reflect on these changes that God is putting in your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor, if you want to come and get, open the doors of the church, and then we'll proceed with our graduation acknowledgement. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. For additional information, please visit us on our website, our Facebook page, or Twitter. 